Welcome friends to another r slash malicious compliance video. If you want to make someone smile today, all you gotta do is hit the like and subscribe buttons down below. That said, our first story of the day is by Kangaroos Love Waffles. Parent wants to be updated for misbehavior, gets hit with a monsoon of phone calls. Some background, this takes place in a preschool with three-year-olds. At this school, many of the teachers have children's attending there, obviously because they get a big discount, which isn't the problem. Most of the teachers don't mind their child's teacher reprimanding or redirecting their behavior as their teachers themselves. But then there's Entitled Admin. She's the annoying admin who would call in the middle of our lessons to remind us to take pictures of the kids or stupid stuff like that, which we do every single day. She loves to micromanage everyone. I've had several issues with her in the past over these phone calls, as have other teachers. Entitled Admin had a son in my class, Tiny Monster. He wasn't really a bad kid overall, but when he would act out, yikes. But my coworker and I, we work in teams, could easily handle him. However, Entitled Admin would constantly tell us to call her when she acts up. Now the thing is, we don't call parents for misbehavior, so why would we call her? None of the other teachers or parents do that. She finally blew up at my coworker and I about it, saying how he never gets prizes and if we just called her, he would behave better. When she left, I looked at my coworker, who looked super annoyed, and a plan came to mind. Cue malicious compliance. Every time Tiny Monster would misbehave, I called the front office. Got up during lessons? Called. Talked back? Called. Screamed at us? Called. Told a friend he was stupid? Called. Kept going pee too much? Called. Didn't cover his mouth when sneezing? Called. Anything slightly out of the ordinary, we called up front to let Entitled Admin know what was going on. Let me tell you, these phone calls really added up. She would physically come to the room after each call the first day, but pretty soon she started getting annoyed and would just say, thanks for telling me, by day two. The fallout, after three days of calling for little things, another admin came to talk to us about why we were calling so much for one student. We explained Entitled Admin's request, and she laughed at how ridiculous it was to have us do it in the first place. She talked to Entitled Admin and explained it was unreasonable to have us call when we don't call other parents. The requests to call her stopped, and we continued on with the school year. It's not a huge malicious compliance, but it was a small victory. If somebody kept badgering you to do something, and the only reason you weren't doing it to begin with was because you know it would annoy them, would you just be more than happy to just totally open the floodgates? Let them just get totally swamped by all the annoyance that you were preventing them from experiencing? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is by Al Bondegas. Malicious Compliance in a National Park Park rangers are pros at answering questions, and we're usually quite happy to do so. Even the ones you hear over and over. Where's the tree that you drive through? What's the sign say on the side of the cliff? Are the ice caves accessible yet? And the one you hear more than all the others combined. Which way are the restrooms? On the occasions when the questioner has a chip on his shoulder, it's really not worth letting it get to you. Just do your job and move on. There will be someone much nicer to talk to before very long. At least, that's what I always told the eager young rangers I hired and trained over the years. It's good advice and I mostly followed it myself. However, I do remember a gentleman who started to get on my nerves back when I was working at a small eastern park renowned for both its history and its scenery. This fellow wasn't interested in either right then, he just wanted a bite to eat. That's reasonable enough and I pointed him in the direction of several nearby establishments. The problem arose when he asked which one I thought he should go to. Unfortunately, for a bunch of reasons too complicated to go into here, we were strictly forbidden to recommend one local business over another. I apologized and explained that I couldn't say one way or the other. But that wasn't good enough for our man. He blew his top at me. That's chicken poop. I pay your salary and so on. You know the drill. I apologized again and let him rant a bit more, and just as I was about to smile and turn away, he comes up with an idea that I'm sure he thought was pretty darn clever. Well, where do you go for lunch? Can you tell me that at least? Or is that something else you have to keep secret? Thank you, God, I murmured. I owe you one. Sure, I can tell you that much at least. I usually go to a place called the Powerhouse, and I can tell you how to get there. He puffed up in triumph as I gave him detailed directions out of town and down a dirt road to the abandoned hydroelectric plant where I like to park and eat my brown bag lunch. 
The road's a bit rugged in stretches, but there's some mighty fine views of the river, and I hope you enjoyed them. If this is the kind of guy to blow up on you about giving directions to a place, is it really the best idea to give them directions to your place of serenity on your lunch break? I guess they wouldn't be able to assume that you would visit there anytime, but you never know what somebody with some loose screws might do. This next story is by Felipe Meyer, less for more. So a few years back, I had this strange experience with a local moving company. I had to vacate my apartment quickly so I wouldn't pay any extra fee, but because of my job, the only date I had free to do it was on a Sunday. I listed to the guy on the phone all of our furniture and made an estimation of boxes and extra items, since we were still organizing everything, and he gave me a price of $400 for the job, including two helpers. Then comes the day we scheduled and the moving guys arrive. We weren't able to finish boxing everything, so we asked them to move whatever was already on boxes, and we would find a way to move the rest later. This one guy started asking questions about the apartment, pointing out how spacious it was and how expensive the rent must be. The other two, instead of picking up boxes, started going into the rooms and making similar observations. Half an hour into this, their boss came to me and said, So this is a bigger apartment than we thought. And there's more unboxed stuff than we agreed on, so to move everything, we would have to charge you at least a thousand dollars. I argued that the size of the apartment had nothing to do with the quantity of things to be transported, and that he was informed beforehand of everything that had to be carried. He again pointed out that there was stuff not in boxes, and once again I said he could move only the things already in boxes, which were less items than we agreed on the phone for the same price we initially agreed on. He said he would talk to his team and get back to me. A few minutes later, he returned saying that they want to move it all for the new price or no deal. I said, let me get this straight. I'm offering to pay the same amount we agreed on for just half of the job, but not only do you want to charge me more than twice it, you want to also decide what you're going to pick up from my stuff, even stuff that I'm telling you to not move? Well, here's another proposal. Why don't you go back to your truck, then pay for the gas you spent and your team's fee from your own pocket, go back to your own home and spend the day watching cartoons? I later told my boss what happened, and he gave me a day off during the week to move. This allowed not only finishing boxing everything up, but also to hire another company, which charged me only $250 for the whole job, since it's cheaper to move on a weekday. If somebody tried to openly scam me that bad, I would definitely pop up wherever I could, whether it is Google reviews, Better Business Bureau, just anywhere where you can establish what happened with that company. Because obviously, that's ridiculous. This next story is by Boris Xanovovich. As much time as I want, you say. A few years ago, my mother started working an online job because she didn't have the time for the in-person work. Especially since my little sister was but a chubby toddling kid and everyone else in the house had school or work. Now she got hired and worked her way up until she pretty much became the CEO's right-hand woman for their home-based workers here. She got good at her job and was offered a raise and free apartment in the Middle East so that the CEO and some other execs could work with her personally. She was torn at choosing between staying with us and leaving, but the new paycheck was almost thrice what she was already earning. Pretty generous, don't you think? She got even more work done in less time, and soon she was alone doing like 60% plus of all the salary calculations for the company. Or at least the Mideast employees, can't remember what exactly, plus whatever CEO and Jane, the CEO's significant other, had her do. It was all fine for about a year and a half until Adam was hired. The way mom described Adam was pretty much high school sports jock, swaggering about and acting like he was hot stuff. He eventually got into CEO and Jane's circle of friends and started bad-mouthing my mom in his department and in meetings. Didn't help that Jane was jealous of how much my mom was working with the CEO. After months of workplace harassment and CEO's visible distrust of mom, she asked him if she could end the contract early. No pay for the unfinished duration, no need to pay her tickets home, no need to get the severance package dated in the contract. She was miserable and stressed. CEO said that he didn't want to end it early, considering that she still had about a year in the contract. Mom instead asked if she could instead go home for a month, since Christmas was coming up. CEO said, sure, take all the time you want and relax. Take all the time you want to relax. Mom agreed to that, and CEO scheduled and paid for her flights. 
Christmas came and went and CEOs freaking out because my mom didn't board the return flight back to work. Her phone was ringing almost every day. The only time she picked up, she put him on speaker. She had her hands full and he was basically begging her to come back. I caught a couple snippets about how the rest of the salary people were overworked and he was willing to increase her pay even more. He kept calling for the remainder of the contract period, but she never spoke to him again. Not even for the pre-Christmas pay that she never got. He even tried going through mutual contacts. Didn't work. She looked pretty relaxed to be back home with us. I feel like in a lot of situations, money could buy you happiness, but this is one of these situations where you can see even if you had unlimited boatloads of cash, if you're not happy with your situation or the circumstances around it, you can buy all you want or you can have all the money you want. If you can't change that circumstance, you're not going to be happy. Our next story is by Zumbalower. To get the reimbursement from my father's funeral service, he needs to sign the paperwork. In my country, as the closest relative, you can ask for a set amount of money from the Health and Social Services Bureau to help cover funeral expenses. After my father passed away, my mother wanted to collect this money since my father's illness had left them in a bad economic situation. So she went on to fill and collect all the needed paperwork and asked my husband to please go with her to deliver them at the social service office. The clerk says, what brings you here? Mom says, I'm here to request the funeral help money. The clerk says, okay, do you have all the paperwork? And she says, here it is. She hands in a very thick folder containing my father's death certificate, like 15 forms, and a bunch of other assorted papers. Note, in my country, paperwork required for any process is usually comprised of all kinds of forms, two or three relevant documents, and a bunch of non-related documents. After checking the documents, the clerk turns to my mother and says, sorry, we will not be able to give you the money. She asks why? The clerk says, this form needs to be signed so we know that the person directly registered in our database is okay with you receiving the money from his funeral. Second note, the form couldn't be filled in advance to my father passing away since it needed to be linked to his death certificate. Mom in a rare are you kidding tone says, so you're saying I can't get the money because there's no signature on the form that needs to have his death certificate number so you know he's okay with me having the money of his funeral? The clerk says, exactly, beaming a smile, we need a signature. Cue malicious compliance. My husband says, so what you're saying is you need a signature? The clerk says, yes, we need a signature so we know the person directly registered in our database is okay with the lady receiving the money from his funeral. My husband says, you do realize the person directly registered in your database is the deceased person? and you're asking for a signature in a form linked to his death certificate to confirm he's okay with his widow receiving the money from his funeral? The clerk says, yes, we need a signature. Husband says, okay, a signature? Clerk says, yes. My husband stands up, takes the form, leaves the office, goes to find a pen, finds it, signs the paper, and comes back. He says, here's the signed form. The clerk says, oh, great, you could get it so fast. It usually takes longer. So my mom got the money, and both my husband and mom swear the clerk was not being ironic or had any double intention when she congratulated my husband on getting the signature from a dead man. Sure, buddy, let me just go ask his ghost to sign it real quick. What would be great is if in that situation, the clerk's like, wow, you got it so fast? And you're like, yeah, we brought him along. I wonder what that would leave the clerk thinking. And our final story of the day is by Kaiser Espinoza, another closed bank account tale. I'm in the UK, and I had an account with the Halifax since I was 16, and back then, they were the only ones to give a debit card I could use online, Visa Electron, at that age. When I started full-time work at 18, I upgraded to their ultimate reward account. If you deposited more than a thousand British pounds per month, it was free. Otherwise, it cost 10 pence per month. Got me free travel insurance, car breakdown cover, and the odd cashback discount, so it was worth it for a tenner although I was always over the thousand, so I got it free. Fast forward about 15 years, I uproot and move abroad. I want to keep a bank account in the UK, obviously, but since I'll not have salary going into it, I didn't want the 10 pence charge adding up, so I took my ID and went to the branch to switch back to a regular free tier account. But I can't. The process was I had to arrange a one hour appointment to discuss my options, and they couldn't just switch accounts like that. 
Although they could switch me up just like that in an instant. I told them I'm moving abroad, so there's nothing to discuss. Please just do this. Nope, need to discuss options. Only appointment was two weeks out, so I left it. In the UK, there's a process that makes switching banks really easy. When you open a new account, you can sign a form that allows them to transfer all of your money and recurring payments, contact your employer, and close your old account for you. So I went to another bank across the road, since I had my ID with me, and opened an account on the spot. I signed the switching forms and within a week, had my new account and the old one closed. No hour-long discuss options interviews. The old bank did call to ask why I switched, and when I explained, they still said, it's our policy. Well, okay, but your policy cost you a customer. Now I don't know if discussing your options is actually their way of trying to swindle a customer, try and get you in a room with a really good salesperson to convince you to do one option or another that ends up getting the bank more money, but I do think it's hilarious that they called OP up and asked why they switched. And then after OP gave them a very legitimate reason, they go, well, that's just our policy. It's like, yeah, I learned that the hard way, that's why I left, and that's the answer to your question you called me about. What do they even get at that point saying that it's their policy? It's not like they're going to win OP back over it. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. So of all these stories I've read today, which is your favorite and why? Let me know in the comments down below. And if you haven't yet, if you could like and subscribe, that would mean a lot to me. Whatever you do, whether it's liking, subscribing, turning notifications on, all of it helps grow this channel and I appreciate the heck out of it. So until next time, I'll see you all tomorrow with some more stories.